What's up, traders? Anthony Cardelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. Today's panel discussion is focusing on the latest CPI data. What does this mean for the Fed and markets going forward? My guests for today's panel are CIO at Unlimited Funds, Portfolio Manager of Unlimited Multi-Strategy Return Tracker, ETF symbol HFND, and former IC at Bridgewater, Bob Elliott. And we have Senior Portfolio Manager at Trivest Wealth, a CFA charter holder, investment pro columnist at FP Investing, Martin Pelletier. Today's podcast is sponsored by FTSE Russell and Trade Station. FTSE Russell is the home of the Russell 2000 Index. Did you know that with an 81% share and $1.6 trillion in institutional assets benchmark, the Russell 2000 is the top choice by far among institutional investors? Like all Russell U.S. indexes, it is a rules-based, transparent, and reliable, regularly updated with the latest IPOs and annually rebalanced. For more info, go to footsierussell.com. Now, are you a serious futures trader? And do you want a powerful platform to match your skills? Enjoy flexibility and trading power with TradeStation's award-winning platform. Learn more at tradestation.com slash Anthony. Now, before I get Bob and Martin in here, I want to remind all of you that Futures radio show podcasts are recorded and posted on iTunes, Spotify, and pretty much everywhere you listen to your podcast. Throughout today's live discussion, subscribers to the YouTube channel can ask us questions in the chat. So please take a quick second and subscribe to the channel and hit that like button as I look forward to chatting with all of you throughout today's show. Now, let me bring in Bob and Martin. What's up, guys? How are you guys? Good to see you. Good, good. Thanks for having us. I'm excited for today because I've never spoken to either one of you um, on video. I've actually spoken with Martin. Martin and I were on a Spaces with Shy Girl a while back. And uh, and over the past year, I've become a massive fan of, of what you guys put out together. I saw you guys interacting a little bit on Twitter. And so I'm really excited just to get the two of you together uh, and just you know talk about some of the things that are happening in, in these wild markets. Yeah, so first great. thing, I, I'm excited. Yeah, it's great. It, it's it's always fun to meet different people that and put us together that have never spoken before. We don't know what each other is going to say, and you know we don't have anything scripted out there. But the one thing that we're going to start with is CPI. I mean, it's something that everybody is watching, and we all know. Uh, really, it all comes down to how these markets reacted yesterday, and now we've had a day to di digest what happened. And I'll quickly point out for those of you that maybe don't know, CPI was 6.4% yearly. And what I thought was interesting in the things that are hitting, you know, regular folks out there that everyone's seeing uh, is a 50% increase in shelter, 10% in food, 14% in dairy, 15% in cereal. And I was kind of interesting. I saw somebody put a tweet out about that. And then 8% in eggs. We all know everyone's got all the memes out there about eggs right now. It's kind of one of that new craze. Uh, and so we're seeing inflation come in and it's really impacting everybody. And, and I think that the one thing that everybody was talking about yesterday was the surprise that the market bounced back, right? Because everyone thought after the CPI number came out a little bit hot, and we'll see if you guys even thought it was hot, that they're kind of surprised that the market bounced back. And actually today we're starting to see, you know, the markets grind up a little bit higher. Maybe we'll start with you, Bob. And what was your thought on the initial reaction uh, from yesterday's CPI? Well, I think the the main um, the main thing that the CPI report showed was uh, and really continue to show is that um, it's pretty, pretty tough. Beating inflation is tough. It takes time. We aren't on a straight line path down. I think those folks who uh, initially thought that, um, you know, who thought basically, you know, in the in the in the last couple of months last year that we were going to go directly down back down to target um, were mistaken. And in particular, not taking into consideration the fact that a big part of the disinflationary pressures that we've seen have come from the amelioration of the supply chain effects and so we got inflation and then disinflation and now that's sort of moderating back again plus you had a big 
decline in oil prices, which helped create a disinflationary impulse. But the reality is that sort of core or structural inflation, which is more broad in the economy, is there. It's not as high as it was in early 2022, but it's still elevated relative to the Fed's target. And so we saw another read of that. I think the main place, frankly, where that is uh, applicable is in the bond market, where we have started Mm -hmm. to see actually a relatively significant shift in the expectations of pricing. Those cuts that were priced in 23 and the back half 23 have largely come out. Um, And so that's really where we're seeing the market action. Things, you know, inflation, important to recognize from an equity perspective, isn't necessarily bad because elevated inflation leads to elevated nominal sales and nominal earnings. That's offset by higher interest rates that typically come with that inflation. And so you put that all together. It's not obvious that the continuation of elevated but not extreme inflation is a real problem. And if anything, what it looks like is the Fed is kind of behind the curve on on the possible reacceleration of inflation. And that's actually good for corporations. And so to see not much move in the equity market uh, on this incremental information is sort of consistent with that overall picture. Most of the excitement is in the bond market right now. Thanks for that. Now, Martin, what was your initial take off of the reaction uh, from yesterday's CPI data? Well, market pundits are shaping their opinion around their current positions instead of looking at the data. And that's the nice thing about Bob. And I, and I love the, the, the information he provides is trying to be as objective as possible. And, and from what I've seen out there, there's the disinflation camp and then there's the reinflation camp. And the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, like for example, for those who are touting the disinflation, they're looking at the, the three month annualized and saying, well, hey, core, a headline annualized three month is only three and a half percent. We don't have a problem here. And then you have others showing, pointing to uh, commodity prices on a year over year basis that are still quite high. And in reality, the, the answer is somewhere in the middle and it comes down to what is the pace? Are we going to fall back down to the 2% target rapidly? Um, and the data is not showing that and it could take a little bit longer than what many, many expected. It may not get there. And from what I've read, uh, the toughest part is right now is, I mean, the hard, the easy work, easier work has been done. Now um, is, is how do we get to um, continue, continuation of a drop in inflation uh, pressures, especially when we're seeing uh, YOLO still on the, on the services side. And, and then you have a softening. I mean, I, I just don't get why central banks would not maximize the impact of their hikes already um, instead of softening their talk. I mean, why not just say, let, let's just not provide, like Bank of Canada, we're basically, we're not doing any more hikes. Um, and, and, and why even say that? Why not just maximize it? And so, you know, we're seeing things like uh, the real estate market pick up again in Canada, uh, simply because people think, hey, well, we're getting rate cuts in the second half. This is over now. If supply is low, good time to load up again. And that's not the type of activity that I think central banks want. I think that's a great point. Bob, why do you think that they're that's the way they're approaching this? Well, I, I think the thing that you if you look in the history of central banking and and, um, you know, it, it can it, it's an important study, um, partially because of the lesson learned. But I think more importantly, because what you see is that over time, central bankers respond to conditions in similar ways, despite Um, you know, despite the years and years that have passed. And I think a big important part that you see is that central banks, central bankers are constantly trying to achieve that soft landing. They're enamored with the allure of the soft landing. Like, why are we talking about soft landings? Like the, uh, yes, once in a while, soft landings happen, but by and large, they don't happen. By and large, what happens right now, what's happening right now is inflation is elevated relative to desired, at least certainly in the U.S. context. And the way you resolve that is through creating slack in the labor markets. Like that's the way it works. 
And instead, what we're talking, you, you listen to Chairman Powell and he says, well, the disinflationary dynamics happening and growth is strong. And it looks like, you know, if to finish his sentence, it sure looks like we're going to get a soft landing or I'll try my best to get there. And to be clear, that has existed through all time. If you go back and look at Volcker, he was enamored for many, for he, there were three periods where he tightened and then eased in response to flagging growth, right? And he was enamored with trying to get to the soft landing. So that's what we're seeing is everyone's trying to get to a soft landing rather than, I mean, really only the Bank of England is the one kind of sitting there and, and speaking truth about what is the most likely probabilistic outcome. And so they're behaving that way, which is that they're not trying to maximize, as, as Martin's saying, like they're not trying to maximize the impact of their of their tightening cycle. What they're trying to do is to, to navigate to perfection, which is implausible. And and, and I find that when you try and have your cake and eat it too, it, it, it just never works out and you, you get unintended consequences. And the elephant in the room here is, I mean, I was at uh, an event yesterday with uh, um, the BDC and their chief economist and, 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 and there, there seems to be no one wanting to talk about fiscal, right? And this is, a key, in, my, in my opinion, this is a key difference in, than where things were before. We, we, we had quantitative easing uh, for a decade and we didn't see inflation and you had a low unemployment and you had the perfect conditions. Um, but now, all of a sudden now you have that and everyone's saying, well, okay, well, we had supply chain disruptions, but we had fiscal spending that we've never seen before and rightly so at first. But the taps weren't closed off. Um, we're still running very large deficits um, in in the U.S. and in Canada, and, and and so that that runs counterintuitive to what the Fed and other central bankers are trying to do. And so why not? Um, why is not? Why are we not looking at that? Why are we not talking about the the fiscal side of things? Why do you guys think that the market is so fixated on the soft landing and believing that the that it's it's actually become such a higher probability over the last several months? I spoke with a, a couple people on the show and they're just like, you know, that I guess they were saying a little bit that they were surprised at how high of a percentage it's, it's gotten to that this is actually a possibility. I don't know what the current percentage is. I don't even know how to actually find out what that is, but um I've been hearing that it's like 30, 40% probability that that would happen. And the market's almost acting like it's even a greater percentage of that. I'm just curious, why do you guys think that the market is acting this way? Like it doesn't believe the Fed. Recency bias. Everybody thinks we're going back to 2021. Everybody, you know, you can see that the top performing stocks were the worst fundamental uh, uh, stocks out there. Um, it's a long duration equity trade. It's that simple. And, and I track the uh, triple Q, which is the NASDAQ versus the TLT, which is the 20 year treasuries and pull up a chart over the last, maybe I'll put it on while Bob's talking on Twitter, yeah. but um, there's, I mean, it, it's a long duration equity versus long duration uh, bond trade. And Bob was mentioning earlier about how bonds are repricing some of the risk there. Equities are not on the long duration side. And so people want to chase they're addicted to low rates, addicted to duration, and they want that soft landing and and rates back to where they were in in 2021. And I just don't see that happening. But you know, I'm I guess I'm a lone voice in in the wilderness. Martin, I actually I could pull up a chart right now. I'm gonna go to something. I'm gonna go to start going to, to some of the tweets that you guys put up as well. And what did you want me to put up? What was the chart? Was it pull just up, the uh, pull up the 12 month? TLT versus QQQ. I don't know. I'm trying to remember how to even do that here on Trading View. Let me see if I can do that. Well, let me. I'll pull up the TLT uh, to start, and then I'll pull up the the QQQ. And add the plus on the yeah. Do you know how to do it on here? I'm not exactly sure how to yeah, do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll post it. Bob wants to comment. Oh yeah, there it is. Boom, got it. There you go. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I, I think you know the the biggest th the biggest thing in terms of uh, let it let it uh, get up there. But I think the the biggest thing that we see 
in the market right now is that um, it, is this disconnect between the two different sides of the market, the bond market, which is really pricing in, you know, still, even with the moves that we've seen so far, is still pricing in an expectation that we're going to move some, you know, relatively swiftly to uh uh, to a recession dynamic or move relatively swiftly to cuts, right? Even though some of the cuts in the back half of 23 have been priced out, you still have 130 basis points of cuts or something like that between the December 23s and the December 24s. That's a lot of cuts in the market given the uh, inflation dynamics that are occurring. And so, you know, that 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 was being priced in the bottom. Frankly, People are not yet pricing in. Um, you know, I think in some ways don't see that action happening. And that's true. Uh, but the probability that we get through this whole dynamic and there is no economic, meaningful economic slowdown, right? That, that we have a, what, you know, I've, talked about is immaculate disinflation, where inflation goes back to target without any impact on the real economy. Um, that seems like a low probability, yeah. too. And so everyone's kind of betting on, uh, you know, betting on a, uh, on an outcome, on particular outcomes that, frankly, are like pretty low probability. Um, and, you know, you get this sort of action. And I think that's exacerbated in the more recent period by the fact that in the last couple of years, like cross asset positioning, uh, and, uh, has has gone down. Who are moving between and stocks and putting together multi-asset portfolios have gone down relative to the history, and so you get kind of all this combination together that's creating this outcome. What I so find so interesting about this is is that as a trader, as an investor, I always look for where the highest probabilities are. Right. And it seems to me as though the market is always pricing in these low probability outcomes, which is totally backwards to what, you know, um, what we would look at as a trader and investor. So it's pretty interesting um, from that perspective. I actually want to go to uh, I want to go to your tweet, Bob, because I, I just I do want to bring this up. you got a lot of people talking about it on Twitter. And, you know, just to stay a little bit with on the CPI and the inflation, you put this out. And like I said, you got a ton of likes and a lot of people were, were discussing it. And I'll quickly read the tweet and then maybe you can go over it. So inflation is difficult to put to rest. Today's CPI showed the continued challenge. Core goods disinflation reversing with more room to run on used autos. Shelter remains elevated. And once you take out oil price impacts and Goofy Med Insurance Services X Shelter remains elevated. And I, everyone's really talking about this. And I think it just, you know, I always like to talk about people's tweets and maybe shed a little bit more light um, on what you put out here in this thread. I think Bob's a little delayed. Yeah, yeah. I think here, this, but... um, I really tried to, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can you can hear me all right, but we, we're we're um, good. Yeah, you're just I a little to delayed. Pack it, from cram us. as much as I possibly could. And okay, uh, as much as I could in you know uh, in in a short set of characters. But I think that chart really kind of gives you a sense of the path, which is if you look at the dark blue line, you see those core goods prices, which were high early in 22 and then fell. But the reason why they were high and then fell was because you had a situation where you had supply chain shocks and then you had those resolving. And so you had prices go up and then go down. And now we're moving back. And a lot, a lot of people, if you go back to like November, were betting that that would continue to decline at that pace. And it's just like, that's not how it, how it was likely to play out. And then, you know, you have essentially services, true services are still elevated relative to desired and then shelter which is still high still growing which you know people will walk around and point to zillow rent thing context you know rents are eventually going to go down but it's so important to recognize that um yes front end rents have stopped growing as fast but there's a huge amount of rent repricing that exists in the market that takes time to flow through. And so that is real inflation. Like if you had a two-year lease that was written, uh, you know, in the summer 
let's say of 2021, and then you get the lease written in the summer of 2023, that is going to be a huge increase in your expected rental cost. And that is real inflation. And it takes time for that to flow through. And so, you know, some people will point to that and say, oh, well, rental inflation is dead. But if you're paying rent, uh, you're, you're feeling it as your rents reset. And so I think that, you know, that's a, that's a real thing. And you put this together, this combination of dynamics is one where the big disinflationary pressures that were kind of creating a slowing of the, of the overall CPI numbers, the core CPI numbers, that stuff's coming out and some of the structural issues still remain. And you're not going to get relief from rents for a while, 12 months, let's say. And so that overall combination is not very good. Uh, you know, inflation is still too high and demands, uh, you know, the Fed to do more as a consequence. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I looked at was the wages and I'm no, you know, macro expert here, but it's not keeping up with what the costs of all of these things are going up at that same rate. And that to me, in its own right, just looking at that, that's not good. You know, it's the, the wages, I think, was up, what was it, up 6.3%, which is obviously good, but it's overall, it's it's not up to where it should be. Maybe you talk a little bit about that, Martin. Well, this this is where Main Street's going to revolt here pretty soon. They're being told to exclude all of these items in their inflation prints. Exactly. And they go to the grocery store and or they fill up their car, which is a little bit better, but not that much better. And their shelter costs are that are, are, are not improving. And they're being told, hey, this is all transitory. We told you it was. And and it's like, <laughs> wow, well, my life certainly doesn't feel that way. And and so um, governments are still spending money, fueling inflation. Uh, they're told that rates are gonna, you know, moderate here, and 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 so your your wages just aren't keeping pace with inflation, and so this is a concern of mine that that you know just Google strikes or Google wage inflation, and maybe there's a delay or a lag, same thing there, but people are gonna start you know wanting to get paid more and more money, and and that's where you know Bob and I were talking earlier about maximizing the impact of what you've done already. To, to to stop people from doing that because you can't blame them and and so that's that means inflation could be stickier than what uh market participants believe three scenarios in, uh, disinflation or the immaculate disinflation which i'm going to use now thanks bob that's outstanding um you know inflation comes back again no problem um which is the commodity bulls copper and we're gonna rip it again or inflation sticky and it doesn't fall as fast as what uh people expect and then you have to look at what the market's factoring in and so i think the longer that this inflation continues to not disinflate as much as fast as what people expect the more the stronger the revolt you're going to get and the pushback you're going to get from from main street and we'll talk about this this you put up on your twitter is u.s inflation today versus 1974 to 84. Yeah, I found this chart. And uh, now I personally believe that we're more in a 19 post World War II scenario where you had an interruption of the economy by a world war. And we had interruption of the economy by a world war on, on COVID. And then you had the starting up. And so there's a lot of similarities. And uh, there's a, an excellent strategist, uh, Jurian Timmer from Fidelity that uh, posts some analogs to that, that we follow. Um, having said that, you know, if you're talking about inflation, everybody wants to look from, you know, <laughs> 1970s, 1980s. Um, and, and so uh, the, the point of this is that it's probably not gonna fall as fast from here as what many expect. It, it could take longer. It is coming down, right? And so is 3% the new target instead of two? It's four become the new target instead of three. That's where it's going to get really interesting. And then what are markets uh, factoring in? And are they going to be disappointed? And especially on the on the duration exposure within the S&P. Well, let's talk about that. Bob, what do you think the markets are expecting? What are they what are they anticipating based upon the per current price action? Two, three, four. S 
Sorry, sorry, was that for me or for Bob? For Bob. I think Bob's frozen. There he goes. Well, I, in general, the market's expecting, uh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I was just doing one of these things. The internet was fine. So I don't quite know what's going on. But um, the you know, I think in general, the markets are expecting that we get back to, you know, two to two and a half percent inflation forever. You know, that's what the market, if you look at the curves, like, you know, people will squint and they'll be like, well, you know, priced in break even inflation has gone up from, you know, 225 to 250. It's like, okay. But like the inflation rate over the 1970s was way, way higher <laughs> than, yeah. than, you know, 250. Um, and so really what I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a real expectation, particularly in the break-even markets, that we're just going to go back to normal. And that's, I'd say, that's also very typical. Like when you see these big, let's say economic, these more secular economic shifts. So like, for instance, when we went from a period of, of leveraging up to leveraging down, everyone expected, you know, the economy to come roaring back after 2008. And instead it kind of, and interest rates were for a very long period period of time same sort there was no inflation for a long time now there's inflation and people are expecting that inflation's just going to go back to where it was over the previous 40 years and that actually shows that creates a lot of opportunity in terms of trading markets because what it does is that you know the market can be caught meaningfully offside for a long period of time constantly expecting us to get back to normal inflation when the reality is we're constantly not at normal inflation dynamics i i think i think i'd like to jump in on that i think the big question is is that was there a sea change was there a structural shift um there was in 08 there was in 2000, okay, like just from, from various market events and economic events. Those were big structural shifts. And the market dynamics changed following both of those events. It didn't go back to the way it was the decade before. Neither situation went back. After 08, we didn't go back to the commodity bull run. That ended, okay? And then we shifted back into quantitative easing and, and low rate policy and and long duration equities now the big question is everybody's ignoring covid situation in 2020 and in my opinion that was a structural shift that was a sea change okay and it caused ripples throughout the global economy in many different ways so yes supply chains are going to normalize but you know you look at the labor force I'm a big fan of, of uh, Charles Goodhart's book, uh, the, uh, um, talking about the, the 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 jobs and 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 individuals um, and 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 how there's a shift in dynamics. Again, a lot of baby boomers leaving uh, the workforce. Um, now, some of them want to come back, um, but they left, and so now we have labor shortages uh, in developed countries. And Japan, you say, well, we'll look at Japan. Well, Japan outsourced it to their labor situation to China. Now, China is no longer an option for a lot of countries, given what happened in, in, uh, since, since COVID. And so there are some structural changes in many different areas. And so to say that it's going back to the way it was before, as a portfolio manager, you're not doing your clients any service. Maybe you're just trying to recoup for the losses you made last year. I mean, no doubt. I mean, that, that seems to be the psychology of what's happening on right uh, happening in the market right now. I, I actually want to go back to both of your Twitter accounts. I'm going to go to your account, uh, Martin. Uh, and I, I want to get both of your guys' uh, perspective and thoughts on on what you call the most hated commodity, <laughs> oil. You know, we got some numbers today coming out in oil. We saw, uh, I believe it was a build. I, I think it was 16 million versus 1 million expected. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I saw it quickly come by in the ticker, and then you saw crude oil take a little bit of a dip. You've also got stronger dollar today. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you guys think is is happening in oil, because there really isn't a macro person I don't have on this show. And I honestly can say I don't think that there's one that's bearish oil. And it always makes you kind of think, right? You're like, man, everybody's bullish this thing, but it's the smartest people I know. So I'm like, <laughs> if all of them are thinking that, it, it can't be wrong, but it just seems to kind of just uh, just be stuck here uh, in this mid-70s to, to low-80s, and it can't get any 
uh, any, any legs. We'll start with you, Bob. What are your thoughts maybe about today's numbers that came out and just your overall thoughts on oil right now? Well, I mean, I, I'm uh, not an oil specialist by any means, um, but uh, so I think about oil in the context of a more macroeconomic dynamics. And I think what, um, you know, I think in general, and this kind of connects to the previous conversation, which is like inflation uh, is inflation and inflation protection is under owned by the vast majority of investors, right? And it's important to recognize that if you're an investor, the thing that really matters is your real return. And so the thing that really gets you in trouble is when stocks and bonds go down and inflation goes up or inflation is elevated. And so one of the things that you can do from a strategic perspective is buy commodities as basically the single most diversifying asset that you can have in your portfolio and in particular, oil being a, a uniquely good diversifier in a portfolio uh, where you're, you know, long basically both stocks at, at, and bonds, which is what most strategic portfolios look like. And so that at a, at a high level, like oil, commodities, I mean, radically gold, radically under owned by the vast majority of investors. And then on a tactical perspective, you know. You got to get, you got to roll up your sleeves and get into the nuts and bolts of the supply and demand factors. Um, you know the the basic um, the basic muddling growth is you know looks in the oil market like it's being met with mud, you know muddling growth, meaning muddling demand is being met with muddling supply uh, increases plus some, you know, supply cuts that are, that have come into the market. And so we sort of are looking at something that's kind of, you know, muddling. <laughs> I think it's a little different from some of the other places uh, in the commodity stack, like the metals, which I think look a little more interesting um, from the perspective of, you know, where we're seeing uh, stocks, whatever, uh, you know, inventories and things like that, as well as incremental demand relative to supply that those look more interesting, but you know, oil is, uh, you know, we've got a muddling picture is the reality. So yeah. no particular strong view long or short on a tactical basis. So maybe I'll be, uh, my, my view of muddle is, uh, is an outlier in the world. Uh, there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the price action is reflecting that, you know, and then, you know, Mark, we'll go back to your t uh, tweet where you say IEA raises global demand estimates. OPEC stays the course with output oil prices flat. And as we go back to the most hated commodity uh, and, you know, j just talk to us about what your, your current view is on oil. Okay. So um, the pervasive view is actually quite negative. Uh, it's under owned and being sold by pension plans and global institutions for uh, greenwashing and, and ESG purposes. And, and so the, the, the bad thing is for union members is that their portfolios have lost an important inflation hedge, as Bob had mentioned. We, had a, we I mean, <clears throat> I am bullish in oil. I wasn't an, an energy analyst for, for 10 years, um, but we, we did have almost a, a nil weight for the longest time. Um, until about two years ago. And having a 10 to 15% weighting in energy resulted in our, our balanced portfolios being flat last year, while our peers were down 13 to 15%. So it is an excellent inflation hedge. And if you believe that we're going back to the way it was before, then you want to unwind that hedge. And we're seeing that. We've seen that in the last couple of weeks where people are selling their oil positions and moving into Tesla's or or the ARC, which is the new NASDAQ, apparently, and and oil is going back to 10 bucks. Well, in, the reality of the situation is you've had a 10 year period of a massive underinvestment in commodities and especially crude oil. At the same time, you have people thinking that we're going entirely EV and we're going to see a peak in, in oil demand, when in reality, we're 101.5 or maybe 102 million barrels a day of oil consumption. And with rapid growth out of emerging markets like India, for example. And yes, there are some efficiencies. Yes, there will be some lost demand due to conversions to EVs. Absolutely. Um, 
And then you have those painting a picture of a recession and what that's going to do to demand. But the bottom line is, is that supply has been underinvested in. You have global decline rates. Uh, even if you run five to 10 percent in shale, it's 30 percent. Um, so you're barely, ba barely able to maintain output. And you had overproduction uh, to, to keep up with the recovering demand post uh, the COVID recovery. And so the fundamentally, what I mean by it being the most hated commodity, nobody wants to own it. It's the, the tobacco in your portfolio, but that's costing you something. That's costing you an important inflation hedge. For every 1% uh, increase in inflation, commodity prices will, will go up by 8 to 9%. So um, it's a really good inflation hedge, just having a small percentage of it within your portfolio. Now, near-term numbers like the uh, like the inventory numbers today, um, you know, you do get periods of wonkiness. You had uh, the um, here EIA in 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 the U.S. Um, vastly understate gasoline demand, and then go back and revise those numbers. Um, and then you have uh, now refineries that were shut down to the coal snap that impacted uh, draws, and so. And then you have the SPR. I mean, the SPR is something really interesting. I mean, we're back down to 1985 levels. And somebody asked me that on Twitter. What does that mean? Well, I don't know because we haven't been down to those levels. And they were down to those levels when we were building the SPR, not drawing down. Yeah, I, I don't see how that has any chance of being a bearish case, <laughs> although we see uh, like I said, every time it seems crude seems to get some sort of a rally, it's uh, it, it's just met with resistance. Deep Go back recession, to global deep recession. If you're one of the one of the bears out there, and there are there are the the, the I mean the problem is in today in, in the investment world is it's quite dualistic. We're gonna get a deep recession and and the Fed's gonna blow everything up and buy gold or Bitcoin and. And, or you have those, or we're going to get the soft landing and we're going to go back to yeah. 2% two, 2 inflation and my tech stocks are going to go up 200% and oil's going down to $10 and I'm the new NASDAQ. And, and so the answer is not easy. I mean, those are both very low prop, very, very low probability events in my opinion, but they're all, but they're getting the most attention as if they're high probability. Exactly. Yeah, I know. And, and we... Go ahead, Bob. Just say I was going to say on on and on oil in particular, in the commodity complex in particular, like the um, the convexity of these trades, I think, are is really advantageous. Which is, if you have even moderate growth, extended cycle of moderate growth against the supply dynamics that are in the market and the inventories that exist, both you know essentially private inventories, but also the SBR, right, is a, is essentially a public inventory circumstance. What you've got in that situation is um, you can vary, you can have slowing growth, right, or moderate growth, modest growth, and at the same time create a real squeeze in oil prices. And, you know, I think a lot of people, frankly, did, like didn't trade the 07, 08 period and didn't really have, don't really have an appreciation of how these things can actually play out where you get uh, essentially a big short squeeze in the market as, you know, um, you know, the elasticities are such that people will pay up. And so the idea, and we saw a little bit of it early in the Ukraine war period, right? We saw, I mean, oil surged rapidly in response to what was like, you know, what were those frictions? And so that's what I really like. Like even, you know, even in a recessionary scenario, is oil going to go to $10? Like probably not, unless you have, you know, a, an incredible hard landing, the odds that you could get, you know, could you get $150 oil in by the end of 23? Yeah, for sure. Like that's not, that's not a, a particularly implausible outcome. But right, um, but right now we're in the sweet spot. I don't mind oil prices being where they're at. I don't want oil prices to go to $150 a barrel. Um, where, they at, where they're at right now is generating so much cash flow for these companies, mm -hmm. and they're and they're being and, and it, with the volatility, they're not they're saying, well, I'm not going to put that back in the ground because it could be $50 tomorrow, right? So I, I just I'll maintain my output. I'm going to give you back all this huge cash flow um, right now. Not in 10 years or 20 years, like some of these uh, NASDAQ stocks are promising. 
It's right now. I get that cash right now in a dividend or a share buyback. Okay. And then if I want to take that cash, you know, you can compare the S and P earnings yield to the two year, which is now negative or the 10 year. So I can get 5% on my cash. So I'm getting all this cash and I get in a really high rate on top of that cash. Why would you go long duration? I just don't get it. No, I don't, I don't get that either. I mean, I just pulled up a chart of Exxon Mobil. Look at that. I mean, <laughs> stocks just sits on the highs every day. Um, I think what we, the next thing I want to get to is definitely I want to talk about really six months out right now. You're going to get somewhere. What is it around 5% in the U.S.? I think that's about right. Right, Bob? Uh, um, yep. Martin, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what it is. I know that even for myself, I actually was looking at some of the CDs. You know, you keep getting emails. Hey, open up a CD. You know, you can get five and a half percent. You're like, really? <laughs> Why am I sitting in the, <laughs> the SPY right now? Right. And it kind of it, it triggers that in my mind. And, and also why would I own gold and maybe some other things? And so I really want to get to that. I just want to remind everybody today's podcast is sponsored by TradeStation and FTSE Russell. And go to tradestation.com slash Anthony, and they're offering 50% off commissions for the lifetime of your account. Uh, use that code F-U-T-R-A-F-Z-T. The link is down below in the description. If you're listening to this later in audio, it's also in your description. Uh, just go to tradestation.com slash Anthony. Um, let's, let's talk about that because I think, you know, I was talking with my wife about this yesterday. Uh, you know, great Valentine's Day discussion, right, everybody? <laughs> hey, you know, you can go and buy Let's a talk market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you I pull work. up the Twitter, too? You're like, look at these charts. I have Hold on a minute. What do you think of this, right? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> talk dirty to me. I don't want oil. <laughs> I said, you know, we were talking about just investments, you know, you're getting near a tax time and all these different things. And the market's been really good at the beginning of the year. I pretty much gotten out of all the stocks I bought at the beginning of the year. I did own Tesla, Martin. I know, don't hate me on that, but I did. I dumped it at 150 something, 170 something, 180. And I'm like, oh man, it's was at 210 now. Anyway. I, I mean, I don't, I, owning stuff like that is like a double or triple levered ETF. Have fun. Yeah, I know. Right. So. <laughs> Well, we got out of mostly out of the market now, and our plan is really just to then to go into these, you know, six months. I don't know if they're. I think they're just. I think they're just six month CDs and twelve month CDs. where you are going to get somewhere around five percent, right? And it's hard for me as a trader and an investor investor to look at what's happened so far in the market this year. If you were in the market, when the rest of the year you could sit back and just make five five and a half percent, no risk. Right? Why do I want to be in gold? Why do I want to be in the S and P 500? Why do I want to be in anything right now besides that? So I, when I look at it from that perspective, you know, the real life going out there and trading and all the different things that I'm doing and investing, I look at this and say, why even take the risk? I'm surprised it's not something that is I that I see having a greater impact on some of the pricing right now. And what do you guys think, Mark? And you're pointing at me. What do you think yeah. about that? <laughs> I think I think you're in a unique position because you probably did okay last year. Now, if you're a professional, I lost money in the stock market last year. I made Sorry? money trading, but I lost money in the stock. In my in my investment portfolio, I was down. I okay. did get out middle of the year. I just maybe the first quarter. But, but you're not managing. Trading, are, are you, if you if you're a fund manager, okay. And, 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 and you underperform on the recovery, that's massive career risk. Okay. And so yeah. they like to track their peers and their benchmarks. And so what I mean by that, if you run a balance fund last year and you're down 13, 14%, the worst since the 1930s as a, as a 60, 40, and you're like, well, everybody else did it. Okay. And then <clears throat> if you don't uh, own bonds and stocks, or even if you're a NASDAQ, you're down 35% last year and it recovered 15% in the last uh, month here. If you didn't participate in that 15% recovery, you're going to lose a whole bunch of, 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 of uh, unit holders. Yeah. And so that's, that's why, that's why they're doing what they're doing. They can't take that agnostic point of view because they have to track it to the upside because if they miss it. And so that means if the market does roll over again, um, they're going to participate directly alongside it, but everybody else is doing it. And doesn't that set this up, this current moment, this current moment in time that we have for more people now long and probably 
unprotected when it comes to using options and things like that, probably more uh, susceptible to that reverse type capitulation type move, right? Because in my mind, if I, you look back at the beginning of last year, I remember in the first quarter of last year was like the number one uh, quarter ever, I think, at CME Group for options, right? And I know SIBO was probably there too. So you, so it, it seemed as though so many people were really truly protected a lot of, uh, of last year using the options markets, right? And I talk a lot of options traders about this. Then you come in this year and now you've got this, really everybody's kind of comfortable. I, I, w- I don't know if they're maybe comfortable is the right word, but they're, they're in a position now where they are long and they're in the market. And now everything that I listen to you guys about doesn't make me feel comfortable being long up here because the risk reward just seems wrong, right? Well, but there and- are there are things you can like you can utilize within the market. Uh, we utilize structured notes uh, up here in Canada, um, and and we like them because they're backstop. The counterparty risk is 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 really quite small. Um, if the Bank of Montreal goes under, then we're in a little bit of world of trouble up here. But um, and 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 that's a derivative product. Um, it's a derivative product packaged within a, a, a fixed income instrument. And so, you know, we can generate yields anywhere from 10 to uh, 20% um, or eight, eight to 20% with 30, 40% downside protection. And, uh, and so, you know, majority of our clients are thrilled to get double digits and if the markets do what they do and they go down 10 or 15% or up, we really don't care because they're, as long as you've got that 40% downside protection, you know, could do what it's going to do and, you, and, you know, 10%, and then you have a little bit of cash on the side getting five. Um, our clients are really happy about that. So, I mean, using derivatives um, in this kind of environment um, is probably not a bad strategy. I mean, put protection is probably not that, I mean, if we're up 15% on the NASDAQ, um, you know, why not protect some of that? Bob, what are your thoughts on all of this? Well, I think when I look at the, from a macro perspective, the big thing that happened was that most asset managers um, were really all in on the immediate recession uh, trade coming into the year. Yeah. Um, and so if you look, you could look at a bunch of different things, whether you look at, you know, equity long short managers, gross and net leverage or the Bank of America fund manager survey, et cetera, what you see is that professional managers were basically as long bonds as they've ever been and as short stocks or underweight stocks as they've ever been um, coming into the year. And I think the big surprise that, you know, we've seen obviously is, uh, is that, you know, we haven't had an immediate recession. If anything, actually all indications are the opposite, which is that things look better (laughs) than they did, you know, six weeks ago. And so what we've seen a lot, you know, what I think is a, a, an important driver in the market, and it connects to that career risk point, is that these folks who are underweight, there's, you know, the unwind of the immediate recession or the recession now trade is putting pressure on people, you know, it's basically creating big short squeeze, you know, it, it's, it's less long bonds and less short stocks. So it's kind of like the trade is experiencing a short squeeze. And so what you're seeing in terms of the dynamic is actually a lot of people tacking hard to get into the market to both sell out of bonds and 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 short rates and 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 buy stocks back and get more equity risk on the table and that's the sort of stuff that's like not particularly sensitive to whether the current level of stocks makes sense or not which like you know if i had if i was a betting man and i had to say does this current level of stocks make sense to me like not really but that doesn't matter when the flows are moving it in a, in moving it in a direction. And those and the, that positioning, I put out a, a tweet uh, yesterday, I think it was that um, that positioning even through February hasn't really shifted that much. It's moved in the right direction. You know, it's moved in the direction of closing that trade, but it hasn't moved that much. And the longer that we get the economy, the economic data being you know okay, fine to good. And the longer that we get these punishing, you know, the pain trade is an okay economy, the more we'll see that short covering happen. And so that could extend for a few months. Like there's no question that that, you know, still exists and people are facing like big career risks because they were caught underweight coming into the market, coming into the year. 
Yeah, no, great points from both of you. I mean, it, it puts things in perspective. One one market we haven't talked about today, and we'll probably close out here and then maybe get some closing statements from you guys is gold. I mean, gold has come all the way back basically to the lows of the year. You know, I, I'm just so used to this in gold. It's so painful for me. <laughs> you know, as somebody who trades it, I don't really, I, I've tried to sit on positions in it and it feels like it's always sitting against me. So I've started to like buy it. And when it goes my way a little bit, I get out and just, you know, wait for the next kind of situation like this again, because it's just what it's been like. Can never get legs. Talk about it. Maybe Martin a little bit right now, you know, yeah. throw on, put on, add the plus sign there and add in DXY. Yeah. I was actually looking at that. Or, um, so now you know, it's so that. funny. I never lay the over them like this. I'm always going back and forth, but now you've got me doing this. So go ahead. Look at, look at this is one I really, so we owned gold last year and uh, we didn't do very well. Uh, we looked at gold and its performance in the early stage. It, it typically in, in the past, it did well in the early stages of rate hikes and the early stages of, of, of that inflation trade. And it didn't perform very well last year. Um, and the U S dollar went higher. And so it, it tends to have what we've noticed the last year and a half. Um, now I don't want to have, I want to be cognizant of the correlation and causation, but, but looking at it, this, it, it seems to be have an inverse relationship to the U S dollar more recently. And, and so uh, when the U S dollar rolled over and you can see, uh, sorry, uh, went, uh, rolled over and, and came back down again, uh, gold has done well in the last couple of months. Um, and, and so that, that's something that we're really keeping a, a very close eye on. I don't own any, any gold right now. Um, I guess we sold too early. <laughs> we should, um, but, but this is the key chart that I'm watching if for entry and exit point. Yeah. With, with the dollar this morning, I was talking about this in my morning video on placeyourtrades.com where I talked about you know, the dollar rallying today. I saw how that immediately had the impact. Obviously the euro goes without saying, but you know, you even look at copper starting to give back the year, you know, gold, giving back the whole year. I didn't actually look at silver, but I'm assuming it's very similar look. Bob, what are your thoughts on gold? I think the, the biggest thing when you think about gold is um, gold should be thought of as a non-interest bearing money uh, that cannot be debased by, you know, a central authority. And so in that context, anytime, uh, you know, interest bearing money <laughs> has a higher interest rate, particularly a high real, higher real rate, um, but also nominal rates matter. Uh, the more that it has a higher interest rate, the better, you know, the, the, the worse that you expect gold to do, right? Because that there's yeah. a trade-off between interest bearing cash and non-interest bearing cash. If you put on that chart, LTPZ, right, which is the long dated, uh, you know, real interest rate, um, uh, ETF. I, I'm in the ETF business these days. So I, so I think about things from the context of ETFs, you'll see certainly on a short term basis that there's a very uh, high correlation. And then I think the thing that is embedded in it is gold does particularly well in tailed environments, where you see um, circumstances where there where there's the risk of the debasement of money, whether it's inflation or, or other outcomes. And so um What's interesting about this is on a longer term basis, if you just sort of zoom out on the on the chart for the year, what you see is that um, is that gold has actually done very well relative to interest rates, right? Um, in the sense of, uh, you know, gold last year was flat at a time when, uh, you know, LTPZ was down 30%, give mm -hmm. or take, right? And so I think that's what's in, it's it's indicative of the fact. So those are correlated to each other, but divergent, correlated on a short term basis, but divergent. And it's reflective of the fact that there still is a lot of uncertainty about whether the path out of this is, particularly in dollars, easier money than is appropriate, and where gold serves as a as a safe haven. So you know, structurally, I think gold is. Um, I mean, gold structurally is under owned. I mean, talk about oil being under owned. Like gold is even more under owned than oil. Um, I think there's good reasons to have a reasonable allocation in your portfolio. That any time that I mention gold as an asset that you want in your strategic asset allocations, people start to look at me like I'm a nutcase. Um, that I'm buying guns and water in addition to my gold, <laughs> right? And and no, no, it's just it's a good diversifying asset 
in long-term strategic asset allocation that does well in tailed environments and tailed environments happen all the time. Um, you know, if you think in the last, you know, hundred years across the developed world, you've had deflationary environments and relatively high inflationary environments like, you know, 20 or 30% of the time uh, in terms of rolling 12 month periods. So, you know, should you allocate five or 10% of your strategic asset allocation to gold? Like, yeah, you should um, in terms of, of thinking about it. Got it. Well, thank you guys. I mean, we'll leave on this note today as we're running a little bit out of time here is I know that you guys always have the balanced approach, right? You're not just, you're not long any one single thing and you guys look at the, you know, the markets in a, in a more balanced approach. But if you were to look at the markets for the rest of this year, where do you see the greatest opportunity uh, for traders uh, and investors to be in? And we'll start with you, Bob. Well, I'm with you, Martin. Well, my my answer is going to probably uh, piss off all traders, which is I think your best opportunity at this moment is to hold a lot of cash, earn the yield, and enjoy that option value that cash provides because um, – my guess is that there's going to be, you know, the how this dynamic plays out uh, in terms of, you know, where the economy goes and how central banks respond. We're going to we're going to be learning through time and opportunities are going to present themselves. And so, you know, having a reasonably sized cash position when there's no yield cost, right, when you're earning a return on it is something that uh, affords you the opportunity to come into certain assets in the event that they get meaningfully mispriced through this dynamic. So, uh, you know, my all in <laughs> my triple cash, uh, triple levered cash would be perfect. <laughs> it's a joke. You can't get that. Right. But, you know, cash itself, it's boring and it requires discipline, but it may be one of the best opportunities uh, over this year. Martin. Um, I agree with Bob, cash, but I'm going to go a little bit step further, um, companies that are generating cash and companies are generating near term cash flow. So um, now we don't make huge binary bets. Um, if you look at there was a tweet I put out the bottom 250 weighted stocks in the S&P only make up 10% of the index, the top 250 make up 90% of the index. And so it's helpful to know what's in an index you own. OK, and then uh, how much is cash is being generated by the companies within that index. And so we make it down to good old fashioned stock picking like it like the like the old days um, versus passive ETF uh, investing. And that's where a, a good manager will uh, be able to provide some value for you. And so what I mean by that is going in and looking at the companies, looking at Exxon, look at McDonald's, UPS, Costco. I mean, uh, looking at companies that are generating consistent and strong cash flow and giving it to you, right? And then they give it to you and you can buy more stock, okay? Or you could buy more stock in another company, or you could just put in cash and get 5%. So um, it's a really nice situation to be in compared to where we were last year, where you, you had no cash, you weren't getting rewarded for it, and rates were so low and the, the Fed and everybody was forcing you, or maybe two years ago, everyone was forcing you to, to go and own, you know, ARC or go and own these, these 50, 100 year duration stocks, because that's where you were making money. And now that's not necessarily the case. Now, do you still want to own some of that? Probably. Yeah. You know, you don't want to make a big bet. Do you want to own some of that Tesla you were mentioning? Maybe I don't, but maybe. <laughs> Um, you know, I prefer to own GM, but that's me. Um, I'm a little old school, but yeah, I mean, so I, I think that if you look at, there's always opportunities in all market environments and there's some pretty good opportunities at the front end of the curve. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. It was such a pleasure to be able to speak with the two of you together, follow both of you guys on Twitter. On uh, everybody, I highly recommend you follow both Bob and Martin on Twitter. Bob's Twitter is Bob E Unlimited. And Martin's Twitter is M Pelletier CIO. Both of them will be in the descriptions also on our website. 
uh, if, whether you're watching it on iTunes or wherever or listening on iTunes, you can't watch on there. Maybe not just yet. I think that I don't know why I feel like at some point they're going to let these video podcasts get on there. But nonetheless, you two guys are awesome. Highly recommend follow you guys. And just to learn more about you guys, go to uh, their Twitter pages and they have uh, websites and stuff to go uh, to from there. Guys, this was awesome. It, it, it was really, really great to meet you. And I look forward to more conversations with you guys in the future. This is awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. It was uh, it was a real pleasure. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, this will be delivered on audio later. If you like today's show, please share it. Hit the like and subscribe button if you're watching it here on YouTube. That's it for today, everybody. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Future's radio show is produced by Crudelli Productions.